Welcome back, everybody, to the Philadelphia Eagles franchise here on Madden 22. Before we do anything today, I just have to say now, in case you missed the last episode, what are you doing? Go check it out. I'll leave a card at the top right of your screen. It was Jalen Hurts' revenge game in Philadelphia, and it was the craziest game of this entire series. So again, if you didn't watch that one, watch it now before you get to today's episode. So long story short, we were up by a lot at halftime, and then we choked, what was it, a 17-point lead within the span of the third quarter, and then the fourth quarter was just absolutely wild. We ended up winning the game 42-35. So in today's episode, we do have a prospect profile, which is fitting because the assistant GM is talking to us about safety, Matthew Judge. We're not going to be scouting defensive backs today. We're going to be doing that later in the season, but today we're focused on the offensive skill position players, running backs, wide receivers, and tight ends. So we're going to go position by position, assess our roster and where we are at that position, and then look at the draft class. I don't anticipate we're going to draft a running back high because we have the great duo of Taswell Hubbard and Rosemont St. Clair. I'm not opposed to adding depth here, but we definitely don't need a starter because both of these players are fantastic for their own role. And I think I want to get Donovan Krause in some running back sub packages as well so he can get a little bit more involved in the offense. We will briefly talk about the running back draft class. There are a number of possible first-rounders headlined by Wes Lakes, Malik Bostic, the second. We've got Brian Smash Williams from Texas, James Wetzelberger, and Ravion Stewart at the top, all four of whom project to be possible starting running backs on day one. It's a pretty deep running back class. There are a lot of good players here. I do want to go in-depth about one here. Right at the bottom, he's projected to go in the seventh round, and he's a rugby player from Australia. I would like to introduce everybody to Dijalu Cooper. I know it says he's from Abilene Christian, but Australia is not an option in the game, so I guess this is the next best thing. So Dijalu Cooper is six foot four, 250 pounds. He has great size, great athleticism, and he wants to test out being a running back in the NFL. A few years ago, the Eagles went with an Australian rugby player in the seventh round. That was offensive tackle Jordan Mailata, who has been a pro bowler ever since signing with the San Francisco 49ers, largely because of his development in Philadelphia. So maybe the Eagles take another shot on a former rugby player. Just like at running back, we are very strong at wide receiver. Devontae Smith and Tykeen Keon is a great duo. We've been looking for a legit wide receiver three for a while, but I think we found that with JT DeMarco, a rookie out of Ohio State who's had a fantastic season. He had the best game of his career last week, which featured the game-winning touchdown. And we have fine depth as well with Troy Dobbs and Andy Isabella. I'm not opposed to drafting a receiver late in the draft, but it's definitely not one of our big needs. However, I do want to go in-depth about Orlando Higgins Jr. here out of Indiana, simply because he's one of the best prospects in this year's draft class and might be a candidate to go number one overall. Currently, he is the third highest projected player in the entire draft class and the number one player on offense, regardless of position. This is an extraordinarily talented young man. He's 6'1", about 205 pounds. He gives you that height, weight, speed that you really look for in a number one receiver. He's a solid enough route runner, and he has very good hands as well. There are some character concerns with this young man, however, as many scouts do view him as a little bit of a diva. This is pretty similar to last year's number one receiver, Money Montique from Alabama, who ended up going number seven overall to the Minnesota Vikings. So I don't really think these small character concerns will really hurt Higgins, but it's just something to keep an eye on. This is a very top-heavy receiver class, a lot of projected first-rounders. You got Theodore Williamson and Malik Arnold, who are probably going to go in the top 15, and then Nehemiah Serwick, Joe D. Gentry, Julito Atkins, and Shiloh Seekers II, who are all projected in the top 32 picks, along with other guys like Alden Holt, Tim Bonner Sanders, the younger brother of Freddie Bonner Sanders. You're an OG if you remember that name. And then you've got other guys like Aaron Martinez, Brennan Rodriguez, Jonathan Potts. This guy looks like he was born to play for the New England Patriots. You know, he's a gritty receiver, sneaky athlete, hard hat, lunch pail guy, type of player you'd let your daughter date. Again, only OGs are really going to understand the joke. And then as we scroll down here, we got an interesting name here, Tayon Keon out of Texas, the younger brother of current Eagles receiver Ty Keen Keon. So that could be a pretty fun storyline if the Eagles were to pick him. It's not an overly deep receiver class. After like the top 10, who are all projected to go in the top 50 or so, there's a pretty big drop off. So for teams who want receivers, you're probably going to have to go with one early or else it's not likely you're going to get a good one. 
as we look at tight end, this is probably the biggest position of need on the roster. There are some talented players here. Dozier Baxby is an intriguing young guy, along with Delshawn Callaway Riley. But it's no secret we are looking for a tight end. And I think this is the strongest tight end class of the series we've had so far, with a number of players who I think could be starters for us next season. The top projected tight end currently is Omondo Odede from Westlake. Odede was the number one overall player in his high school class, and he never truly panned out at Westlake, only getting around 1,200 receiving yards throughout his career and 10 receiving touchdowns. I think the talent is there, and I think he's going to be a better pro than he was college player, but he just never lived up to the production of being the number one player in his high school class. But he does have the upside to be fantastic. The athleticism is certainly off the charts. And along with his upside as a receiver, he's not a terrible blocker either, which is a pretty big deal. However, there are numerous players who are pretty much marching on the doorstep of being the top tight end in this class, including USC's Machado Yamaguchi. Yamaguchi has not played all season. He suffered a torn Achilles in spring practice and has not played yet this season for the Trojans. So obviously the injury concerns are there, but he's another fantastic athlete. And like Omando Odede, he never really lived up to his potential in college, but I think he's going to be a better professional than he was college player. The Eagles have a history of drafting injured players. Just look at Edmund Orient in the first round this past year. So I don't think the injury concerns will scare Philadelphia away from looking at Machado Yamaguchi. If the Eagles would prefer somebody who is a slightly higher floor than those top two guys, let's take a look at Tryman Bird out of Georgia. Bird has similar athletic traits to the top two players in this year's draft class, maybe a little bit less upside than both of them, but still very solid. He has been by far the most productive in the receiving game of these top three guys throughout their college careers, and many scouts are wondering why Tryman Bird is not projected higher than Odede or Yamaguchi, and they bring up a fair argument because Bird has been by far the best in college, and his upside isn't a whole lot lower, so I fully expect him to rise up the board as possibly a first-rounder once we get to April. Those guys are all freak athletes with great upsides as receivers, but if the Eagles would prefer somebody who's more of a blocker, let's take a look at Chuck Fior out of Florida State. So the Eagles don't really use their tight ends a whole lot in the receiving game. Dozier Baxby, the starting tight end, is the fifth option in the passing game, so because of that, the Eagles best fit at tight end is probably more of a blocker, which is exactly what Chuck Fiore brings to the table. Fiore is an adequate receiver throughout his career at Florida State, but if you're going to use a second or third round pick on him, it's going to be because of his ability as a blocker. Hypothetically, if he were to gain about 30 pounds, he could probably slide him over to the offensive line and he'd be just fine. That's how good of a blocker he is. So the Eagles would rather get somebody who's going to provide help on the trenches rather than a receiver. Chuck Fiore would probably be the best fit of any of these tight ends in this year's draft class. There is some solid depth here as well down the board, but I think if the Eagles want to draft a starting tight end, they're likely going to do it within the first couple of rounds. So that concludes our prospect profile. Let me know which prospects you were intrigued by down below in the comments. Now let's talk about our opponent this week, the Cincinnati Bengals. But firsthand, we have Tykeem Keon, who's a little bit frustrated about his touches, and he wants to get the ball more. I don't really blame Keon because his chemistry with Xander Vanderwall has been very inconsistent so far. And obviously stuff like this is going to happen when you get a new quarterback. However, I guess Keon is starting to get a little bit impatient and he wants the ball more. Keon hasn't had a bad season by any stretch of the imagination, but he's just got an inconsistent amount of touches from week to week. He was pretty good last week with five catches for 73 yards, both of which rank second in his season totals. But he's had games with three catches for 30 yards, two for 26. So he just feels like if he gets the ball more and is a bigger part of the offense more consistently, uh, that he would appreciate that. Let's talk about our opponent here, the two and three Bengals, who are, of course, a very good team led by quarterback Joe Burrow, a.k.a. Joe Shiesty, Joey Franchise, Joe Burr, or whatever you want to call him. Joe Burrow's been fine throughout his NFL career, not quite the player he is in real life, but he has plenty of weapons at his disposal, including Joe Mixon, Jamar Chase, Tyler Boyd, and former first-round pick, Westifawu Iwosu. 
Looking at Mixon specifically, he is going to be very tough to stop as he is one of the best running backs in the NFL. He has been fantastic in each of the first three seasons of this series. And here in year four, he's done even better, averaging over six yards a carry and over 100 yards per game. Added on with plenty of talent on the defensive side of the ball, particularly in the secondary, led by Jesse Bates and my man, Chidobe Awuzie. It's going to be a tough task for our pass game to really get things going. So this Bengals team, I think, is a little bit better than their record suggests, and being on the road, it's going to be a challenge for us. I'm mainly focused on stopping the run because Joe Mixon is really, really good, and then on offense, per usual, the game plan, as always, is to pound the rock and run the football. So without further ado, let's stop the chatter, let's stop the anticipation, and let's get to this Week 6 matchup here at Paul Brown Stadium in Cincinnati, Ohio. The 3-2 Philadelphia Eagles, winners of three straight, have an interleague matchup here against the 2-3 Bengals. It has been a wacky start to the season here for Philadelphia with numerous super close games and numerous blown leads. The first five weeks of this season has been nothing short of a soap opera in Philadelphia, and we'll see how the craziness and the madness continues here in Week 6 against the Cincinnati Bengals. So let's now get this game underway. We'll see if the Eagles can improve their win streak to four games or if Cincinnati can get the win and both teams would go to three and three. So the Bengals are going to open up with the football, which means we get a look at Joe Burrow and company first to start this game off. This is a quick handoff for Joe Mixon, who goes up the middle for an early gain of 13 yards. With how inconsistent the Eagles' defense has been this season, this game could be really good for this side of the ball, or it could be really bad, because there are some moments where the Eagles' defense plays flawlessly and other moments where it is terrible. They do get an opening drive start as the pass for McClellan was overthrown, so Cincinnati would quickly have to punt it, and that means we get to see the offense. Xander Vanderwall misses St. Clair there on third and nine, so the Eagles will quickly have to punt it away. Pretty rough start here for both offenses, as now the Bengals have it here on a third and five. Five wide set, Burrow under pressure, and he connects with his tight end, Rob Gronkowski, to the 43-yard line. Gronk is, in fact, a Bengal. Once Tom Brady retired, he wanted to stick around and play with Joe Burrow. And Gronk is still going strong here at nearly 35 years old as he gets the rock once again and is pounded by Joko Unwosu. But that'll be another first down for Gronk as the Bengals move the chains. From the 27-yard line now, Cincinnati is starting to get something going on this possession. Burrow on first down, under pressure, and he is sacked. Isaiah Simmons comes into the backfield and brings down the quarterback. Isaiah Simmons has had a pretty good start to the season, probably had his best game of the year a week ago against Carolina. Third and 17, the pass for Gronk has broken up, so that'll send out the field goal unit. It's a 51-yarder, certainly not an easy kick, but the Bengals kicker is Justin Tucker, so it's no problem for him as he sinks it down the middle, and the Cincinnati Bengals are on the board as it's now 3-0. That'll bring out the Eagles offense. Not a whole lot going so far for the Birds on this side of the ball as Vanderwall connects with his tight end, Dozier Baxby, for a gain of 22. Dozier Baxby certainly has a chip on his shoulder as we were looking at possible replacements at the tight end position earlier today. Following play, here's Rosemont St. Clair with the spin move wrapped up at the 38-yard line by the superstar safety, Jesse Bates. Now from the 28, it's a play-action fake, and Vanderwall gets sacked for a big loss of 11 by Anthony Nelson. It really seemed like the Eagles' offense was getting some momentum on that drive, but that's a huge sack by Nelson, and that'll back the Eagles up now to a third and 11. Vanderwall again drops back to pass. He goes short for St. Clair. He couldn't find anybody else open. That'll move them a little bit closer to field goal range, but still a pretty poor ending to that drive. Nonetheless, the field goal unit comes out for a 52-yard kick, and Zebediah Phoenix sinks it right down the middle. After a rough preseason, Zebediah Phoenix has been nearly flawless in a regular season as he's only missed two kicks all season. Cincinnati has it back, third and 11, game tied at three. Burrow on the run, unable to get the first down as Bobby Wagner is able to track him down, and Burrow slides before he can possibly take a hit. Both defenses have been very good so far. We have not seen a lot of defensive battles this season, so this is honestly kind of refreshing. Nice little move there by St. Clair, who gains 14. So far, St. Clair's gotten off to a very good start today 
as that concludes the first quarter. We are tied up at three. Neither side has really broken away yet. We'll see if this is the drive where the Eagles offense can really make a dent into this scoreboard. As on third and nine, a great throw by Vanderwall over to Devontae Smith, who brings it to the 42-yard line. That'll keep the chains moving. Smith was, of course, drafted after Jamar Chase, but through the first three and a half seasons has probably been better than Jamar Chase, although Chase is very good in his own right. As Trey Hendrickson sacks Vanderwall for a loss of eight. That'll make it a second and 18 from midfield. Xander Vanderwall looks to throw it. Backs up pretty deep in the pocket. Takes a shot deep for Rosemont St. Clair, who gains 32 yards. That was a great throw and a really nice catch by St. Clair because Jesse Bates was right there to pop the ball out. But St. Clair was able to hold on to possession. Third and seven now. Vanderwall under more pressure, and it's batted down incomplete. Even though Philadelphia has one of the highest scoring offenses in the league so far, I would say they have one of the worst red zone offenses. Too many times do the Eagles have it in the red zone and aren't able to score a touchdown, and they have to settle for more field goals as Ebediah Phoenix does sink the kick. At least the Eagles have a trusty and reliable kicker. Otherwise, that'd be real bad. So now it's third down. Look at this. There's no pass rush. And then you got Joe Mixon completely wide open and alone on the left side of the field. And he brings it to the 42. That is textbook bad defense when there's nobody close to the quarterback. And you have a receiver wide open with 20 yards of daylight between him and any defender. So a big gain for Cincinnati as it's now second and 10. Now Burrow's under a little bit of pressure. Balls out. And it is picked up by Mixon, who does get five. The first round draft pick, Edmund Orient, with his first career sack, which leads to a fumble, but doesn't really matter in the grand scheme of things, since Cincinnati picks it up. Third and five now, Burrow looking to throw it. He tries to get it to McClellan, but the pass is incomplete. So again, Cincinnati is going to have to settle for another field goal. It's going to be a 54-yard attempt here for Justin Tucker in an attempt to tie the game. And the kick is no good. It's wide left. So far, in a battle of the superstar kickers, Zebediah Phoenix has gotten the upper hand. He's two for two. Tucker is only one for two. So the Eagles get the stop thanks to the miss by Tucker. And now they have it back on offense, looking to make it a two-score game as St. Clair goes up the middle to the 38, continuing his very strong start to the game. Now from the 26. Again, Philadelphia moving it very nicely. It's, it's a play-action fake for Hubbard. Vanderwall on the run, connects with Tykeem Gion. Great throw and catch as Keon brings it to the two. Hopefully those two can continue to build up their chemistry as the season goes along. Following play, first and goal. Vanderwall short for Tykeem Keon, who scores for the first time this season. Keon scored eight times last year, but has not yet found the end zone this season until that play. That's going to be the first touchdown of the game. About damn time, and it's now 13-3 as the Eagles extend their lead. Big drive here for Cincinnati. They've got to get something going and try to make it a one-score game before halftime, and that'll certainly help as it's the former first-round draft pick with Stefawu Iwosu out of Illinois who gets a solid gain there, one of the big pieces of this three-headed monster at receiver along with Boyd who makes the catch there for a gain of 10. And, of course, Jamar Chase, who's been pretty quiet so far. Nehemiah Richardson has certainly won the one-on-one -on -one battle against Chase so far. From the 24, about a minute and a half left to go here in the first half as it's Rob Gronkowski who stiff arms the defender and brings it to the 7. Now Cincinnati's really starting to get something going here on this drive. It took a little while for Joe Burrow to get into a groove, but it seems like he has now gotten comfortable. Third and goal. Can the Eagles get the stop? It looks like they do as Tyler Boyd only gets to the two and Philadelphia calls time. So the Eagles defense gets the stop, but not so fast. The Bengals are going to elect to go for it here on fourth and two. Handoff for Mixon and he got it. That was really close, but they're going to give him the touchdown and it is now going to be a one score game. 13 to 10. That will conclude the first half. It's been a pretty close start. Both defenses have played very well so far, but both offenses were able to score on their previous drives, and it seems like both offenses are definitely playing a little bit better. I am switching the game plan on both sides of the ball to focus on the pass because, well, I think we're running the ball well, and we're not throwing the ball all that well so far, so I really want to focus on the pass game, get that going a little bit better, 
And right as I say that, Xander Vanderwall misses an easy throw on third down. So that forces a quick punt. The Bengals get it right back. Third and five. Burrow incomplete as he misses his target, Uwosu. So both quarterbacks are continuing to look quite off today. I think Vanderwall's had his worst game of the year so far. Good throw there for Keon, however. And I haven't been all that impressed with Joe Burrow. Both quarterbacks are hovering right around 50% completion percentage. I think Burrow's actually a little bit under, and Vanderwall's just barely over. First down, play action fake for Hubbard. Vanderwall looking to throw it. He takes his time and launches a dime for Devontae Smith, who gains 15 yards. That was a good play by Vanderwall. He took his time, waited for his receiver to get open, and that's exactly how that play went. Following play, it's a handoff for Taswell Hubbard with blocks, dives into the end zone for a touchdown, and the Eagles are back up by two scores. Great run there by Taswell Hubbard, and it's now 20-10 in favor of Philadelphia. The Bengals have it back. Play action fake. Burrow is swallowed up in the pocket by Jabari Achebe. Achebe completely annihilated the left tackle, Jonah Williams, as we take a look at the replay. Achebe has not lived up to expectations so far this season, largely because he's had a lot of trouble staying on the field. He's been banged up all year so far, but we know how talented he is after his fantastic rookie season a year ago. The pass for Chase on third down, broken up by Nehemiah Richardson. And once again, Jamar Chase continues to be completely out of the game plan for the Bengals' offense. Good gain of 15 there for Taz. Well, Hubbard, who hasn't gotten the ball a ton today, but when he's gotten it, he's been damn good with eight carries for 58 yards and a score. Third and nine now from the 40. Vanderwall looking to throw it. He's under a little bit of pressure. Heaves it up and is intercepted. It's <clears throat> Chidobe Awuzie with the interception, and he gets it to the 39. It feels good getting to clear my throat and then yell out Chidobe Awuzie, just like old times. For those who were here in the Lions franchise back in Madden 20, we got to do that a lot because Chidobe Awuzie was on our team. Third and four, the Bengals do get a nice first down conversion. Again, it's Rob Gronkowski who's been Cincinnati's best receiver today who brings it to about the 41. Now the 39, early in the fourth quarter. Again, it's Gronk. Did he get it? They are going to give it to him, which is odd because it was third and eight from the 39, and Gronk only gained seven, but they're still giving him the first down. That's The math is off there. How can you gain seven on a third and eight and it's a first down? So the Eagles are going to challenge the spot of the ball here because they don't think Gronk got it. Unfortunately, these refs do not know math either, so the play would stand, and the Eagles would lose their timeout as they're the ones who made the challenge. So the Eagles have a timeout flushed away. Cincinnati keeps their first down. Is on second and 10. There's Gronk again. Hit hard by Deshaun Elliott, but he brings it to the 16. Rob Gronkowski looking like his prime self from a decade ago, and he doesn't look like he's older than 25 today. On second and five, Cincinnati gets the touchdown. It's Joe Mixon on the slant pattern, and the Bengals bring it within three points. Cincinnati is far from out of this game as it's now 20 to 17. The Eagles have to keep the pedal to the metal. They have to keep moving the ball down the field smartly, coming off an interception on the previous possession. There's Rosemont St. Clair with another nice gain of 16 yards. And this game has shown how good both running backs can be. Taswell Hubbard and Rosemont St. Clair have been the two best players for the Eagles offense today. Third and six, there's Tykeem Keon with the first down. Doesn't look like Keon is going to get the 100 yards he's asked for, although I will say he's probably been the best receiver on this team, not named Rosemont St. Clair. Play action fake fair for Hubbard. Vanderwall under pressure gets it back to Ty Keen Keon, who gets about 20. It seems like Keon and Vanderwall are continuing to really build a strong chemistry, and if they can stay consistent on a week in and week out basis, that could be a big deal for this offense. First down, there's Devontae Smith open. He gets it inside the 10 to the 8. Even though Tykeem Keon has been a big factor today, so has Devontae Smith. Both receivers have played very well. And then on first and goal, Hubbard plows his way into the end zone for the score. And the Eagles are back up by two possessions. A great run by Hubbard, who has now scored twice today. And it's 27-17. The Bengals have some damage control to do here, down by 10 points with 3.5 minutes to go. Burrow on second down, under pressure, and is sacked by Cleveland Furl. Of course, Jabari Achebe is hurt. It feels like a weekly basis now that he gets injured. Luckily, it's not a serious injury. He shouldn't miss too much snaps here 
and will probably come back into the game shortly. But for now, it'll be the rookie Hannibal Savage in his place. Third and 13, Barlow completely misses the pass on the screen. So fourth and 13 from their own 22. Cincinnati says, screw it, let's just go for it now. They don't really trust their run defense to get a stop, so why not just go for it here and Burrow can't even get rid of it. Fletcher Cox with the sack, and that's probably the dagger. A big sack by Cox. The Eagles have now gotten to the quarterback five times today, and even four years later, the Bengals' offensive line is still terrible. First down from the 14, Hubbard with a big first down run to the three, nearing the century mark in yardage. And the Eagles are continuing to choose some clock. Under three minutes to go now, first and goal from the three. Vanderwall under center, hands it back off for Hubbard. That's a hat trick. 100 yards and three touchdowns today for Tazwell Hubbard. I hope you started him in fantasy because he's putting up numbers. Vanderwall carrying him on his back. If you bench Tazwell Hubbard in fantasy, what the hell are you doing? Wouldn't he be a must-start because he's that good? Whatever, it's now 34-17. The Bengals are down by three scores. They look pretty much out of it, looking for a miracle comeback as McClellan brings it to the 39. If you're going to make a miracle comeback against any team, it's going to be against the Eagles, who have already choked multiple three-possession leads within the span of 10 minutes. Maybe they'll do it within two minutes as that pass is dropped there. That was a third down for the Bengals, so now it's fourth and ten. This is officially the ball game. If they don't get it here, it's definitely going to be game over. Burrow calls for Mixon to go out wide. It'll be a five receiver set, two to the left, three to the right. Burrow looking deep, and it's incomplete. He tried to get it to Gronk, who was open, but the pass was offline. The Eagles would chew clock for the next couple of minutes, and that's how this game would come to a close. Philadelphia finishes off the job here with a nice 34-17 win. The Eagles have now won four straight games and are up to 4-2 and two on the season, while the Bengals go down to 2-4. and four. This game wasn't always pretty, but at the end of the day, it wins a win. Both quarterbacks were very underwhelming. Burrow only completed 50% of his passes, and Vanderwell, outside of the fourth quarter, wasn't all that impressive. I think the real reason why we won today was the run game. Tazwell Hubbard ran like a wild man with 124 yards and three touchdowns. Rosemont St. Clair also had over 100 scrimmage yards. And on the flip side, Joe Mixon only averaged three yards a carry. We completely stopped Joe Mixon today. Shout out to the run defense. They were great. Gronk was very good for the Bengals, 10 for 108. Tykeen Keon with 6 for 74 and a touchdown. Devontae Smith and St. Clair with 59 yards apiece. Even though Tykeen Keon didn't complete his little challenge, he was still very good today. We had five sacks in this game, including the rookie Edmund Orient with the first of his career, along with Furl, Achebe, Simmons, and Cox. And then Zebediah Phoenix did outperform Justin Tucker. Therefore, Zebediah Phoenix is the best kicker in the NFL. Thanks for coming to my TED Talk. So despite not getting the 100 yards, Ty King Keon doesn't seem too upset. He recognizes that it's not all about the stats. It's more so about the team winning and him contributing to winning, which I think is a very mature response from him. I was a little bit worried he was going to be upset that he didn't reach his 100-yard margin, but I'm really happy that he came in and said that because, I mean, that really just shows a lot about his character. So it's good to know that Ty King Keon is prioritizing winning over his own personal stats, and as long as he continues to play well, those stats are going to come. This next game against the Pittsburgh Steelers here is a big one. Just like we had the Jalen Hurts revenge game two weeks ago, this is the Xander Vanderwall revenge game because he spent the first two seasons of his career in Pittsburgh and they just threw him under the rug and drafted a new quarterback in Bjorn Syverson. So far, I think the Steelers are quite happy with that decision because Bjorn Syverson has been fantastic. The Steelers are on a five-game win streak and in that span, Syverson has thrown 14 touchdowns and zero interceptions with a passer rating of at least 116.3 in each of those five wins. This kid is really, really good. And even though I think it worked out for us because Vanderwall is great, Bjorn Syverson appears to be better. So this is going to be a really intense game on Sunday night football, might I add. So Xander Vanderwall faces off against his old team on primetime football against the new shiny toy who replaced him and has been better than him. So Vanderwall has a major chip on his shoulder today, and I think that's going to really fuel him to want to win this game. I hope everybody enjoyed the episode. Make sure to hit the like button. Make sure to subscribe to the channel if you are new. Peace out. Go Birds.